Hello and welcome to Ask Your Academic. Today's session will cover the MSc in Global Mental Health and the MS MPH Public Health. We're joined by our programme lead and um, a member of our administration team and they're here to answer any questions you may have about the programmes that they work on. Um, we've had a number of questions submitted beforehand so we'll do our best to cover off all of those and if during the session you have any further questions you can use the chat box to pop them in there and you can also use that to say hello and let us know where you're watching from. If after the session you have any further questions you can email the programme administration email address and those details can be found on the programme web page of the website. Um, and if you've got any questions that are specific to funding or your application or that, I'll pop some uh, helpful links into the chat box for you to follow up with those. Um, we're recording today's session, so that will be made available to you afterwards. So if there's anything you missed throughout, um, because there's always lots of information shared, you can go back and watch that. So we don't have a lot of time, so we'll get started. Um, so if our panel could all introduce themselves and give a bit of an overview of their programme, that would be great. Sharon, do you want to go first? Yep, I, so I'm Dr Sharon Greenwood and I'm the programme lead for the Masters in Public Health programme and I'm standing in um, programme lead for the Masters in Public Health programme online as well. Um, the programme, do you want to do a little bit about the programme just now or shall we? Yeah, so um, the Masters in Public Health programme is a year-long programme. Um, it's comprised of 180 credits. 120 of those are taught elements um, of your programme. Um, for the MPH, we have three core courses. So we have Introduction to Statistics and Epidemiology. We have Principles of Public Health. And we also have um, Research Methods. And all three of those courses are taken in semester one. The other required course that you have to do as part of your MPH is a 60 credit research method, a research pro uh, project where you do a bit, a bit of self-directed research um, supported by a supervisor um, and that is what makes you eligible for a master's level qualification. Um, people who are going to be on the standard MPH um, can take three optional courses in semester two. We also offer four specialisms um, in MPH and this means that you get an additional element on your transcript that says you have a an MPH with specialism in data science, for example. And the four specialisms are health promotion, health economics, um, epidemiology, and data science. And each of them have an associated core course. So if you are studying on, an, um, on a specialism, you have to take four core courses and two optional courses. Um, I'm joined today by Margaret. So I'll let Margaret introduce herself briefly and then we can pass on to Julie maybe. Yep. Hi, I'm Margaret Ashton and I'm the administrator for both the on-campus MPH and the online. And if I can just add something to what Sharon was saying. So if anyone was interested in the online, it is slightly different from the on-campus because the online programme is full, is part-time. It's not a full-time programme. And also currently we don't offer specialisms for the online MPH. They're only available to on-campus students. Hey, thank you very much. And I'm uh, Julie Langan Martin. I'm the programme director for the on campus and the on online distance learning MSCs in global mental health. And um, like Sharon said, our MSC is kind of very similarly structured to the MPH, where students do three core courses for the global mental health masters. So they do themes in global mental health in semester one and the research methods course again in semester one. And then they do the mental health law and policy course in um, semester two. And that's the three core courses. Um, students again can do a specialism where they would do four core courses, um, but for those students that aren't doing a specialism, they have three elective courses and then they would go on to do their research project, usually over kind of semester three over the summer uh, summertime. And again, similar to the MPH, the on campus programme is offered part time or full time, and the online distance learning programme is usually delivered part time over three years. So that's kind of a brief summary of our online and on-campus programmes. Thank you. Um, and in terms of the specialisms, when do students pick those for both programmes? So usually I think uh, we're both aligned here, but they would usually pick the specialism in kind of semester one for the on-campus students early on in that semester, just so that we can arrange the, the, the courses that they're needed to do 
so yeah semester one and I think just to also add on to that and I know it's similar for global mental health but your specialism should also be reflected in your project so if you are doing a, pro a, a specialism in health promotion there should be an element of health promotion within your your project as well Thank you. And then we had a few um, questions asking about um, are there any topics that uh, students should brush up on before starting the programme or any sort of preparations they can make before joining? I would just really encourage you to, to have a, a read of um, maybe some of the kind of wider um, newspapers that are in the UK. So reading things like the, the Guardian and finding out what the context of public health is happening in the UK is a really useful introduction to um, the, the concepts that we will be discussing. There's lots of introductory texts as well. And we don't recommend any in particular, but there are a lot of um, resources out there that you can have a look at. And I always recommend students to have a think about looking at TED Talks. Um, and sometimes you get some really inspiring speakers um, on the TED Talks who really summarize and, and capture the passion for the topics. Can I just add there that for the the new, which is going to be a new course, the Introduction to Epidemiology and Introduction to Statistics. Students will, for statistics, be offered um, either to be able to use either R or Stata. So mm -hmm. there will be, you will be taught how to use that and there will be practical sessions, but it may, that's, it may be that's something that you could, um, you could have a look at. There's lots of introductory videos in both of those packages. Um, so, you know, that may be something that you could have a look at before you joined. So when you do join and you're offered um, either R or Stata, you know at that point which one you want to use. Yep. So, yeah, I would agree. So similar to um, the MPH, there's lots of useful documents and literature out there on the WHO website. So the World Health Organization, you can have a look and read about some of the global mental health agendas. Um, there was a series of papers published in the Lancet a number of years ago, which looked at some of the, the you know, the challenges that were facing, um, you know, mental health practitioners across the world. So again, have a, having a read of these things, you know, might be might be helpful. But we're not expecting you to come with loads of knowledge or anything like that. So please don't worry. Um, so you know, there'll be lots of reading lists and things like that made available when you start. Um, so yeah, but these things are quite helpful just to give you a flavour before you before you start your studies. Thank you. Um, and we're always asked about the project. So can you give us a bit more information about that in terms of how students go about choosing a topic and a supervisor? <clears throat> so you're, the students are very much guided through the whole process. Um, they come up with a, a topic. We encourage all of our students to come up with their own topic, but we do offer a series of um, supervisor-led projects as well, where supervisors will propose a topic and um, you can apply to be to take part in that project and to, to be um, the person who does that project. Um, we have supervisors from all across the School of Health and Wellbeing, um, wide range of expertise. And when you do um, submit your kind of idea for what you want to do for your, for your project, you are asked to identify a few members of staff who you would like to work with. And if we can make it possible, we definitely do. We definitely try. Yeah, so we've got a very similar kind of matching process that Sharon's kind of alluded to. So for the Global Mental Health, we ask students to fill in a, a questionnaire online, just kind of highlighting areas that they might be interested in, and if they'd be willing to take a kind of supervisor-led project. And then there is a sort of complicated matching process that happens where we try and align students as best we can with supervisors um, and make sure that those interests are kind of aligned. Um, so yeah, that usually happens towards the end of October, start of November. Um, and yeah, usually there's a good mixture of student-led projects and some supervisor-led projects as well. Thank you. And then one for yourself there, Julie, is um, can you tell us more about the potential placements that are available for your programme and sort of how many of them, what are the, uh, the selection criteria? Yeah, so we have um, a sort of placement with the Glasgow Psychological Trauma Service, which is which sits with the, the within the NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde, and usually the kind of placements take place in kind of semester three, so sort of May June time, after all the top components of the courses are completed and students are just working on their dissertation. We usually ask students to apply um, at the start of semester two, so we just ask them to write a kind of one page summary about why they think it would be a good fit for the, the the placement and what they'd hope to get out of the placement, and then there is a kind of um, 
you know, people score these anonymously and then we choose two people to undertake the placement. So it's, we have two placements available during semester three and they usually last for about four or five weeks. Perfect. Um, in terms of like a typical week, how many hours are students likely to be in class and versus what's expected of them out with of class time? So for the MPH in semester one, most of your core courses will have about two to three hours actual contact time within the classroom. But on top of that, you are expected to do a lot more um, self-directed learning. And there's a lot of resources that you prepare before you come to class. And um, so we do expect you to engage with the resources that are on our virtual learning environment site, which is called Moodle, and um, come prepared to talk in class about your, your issues that you maybe have, if you have questions. And that's the space where we we, we do the kind of active learning that we call. Um, do, Julie, do you want to? Yeah, add very, to that? yeah we're very similar um, to the MPH. So usually for, for each core course, there's between two and three hours of face-to-face -face kind of interaction. And uh, as Sharon said, we encourage kind of active teaching and active learning. Um, and we again have... Um, Kind of flipped classroom resources that are available on Moodle that students can have a look at before they come to class just to ensure that um, you know we are ha having kind of interactive class sessions. So I think it's recommended is it sort of I always get this wrong but I think it's 40 hours contact time and then is it 360 uh, hours? four times the yeah. contact time. Yeah so yeah if that makes sense. I think it's they call it 200 notional learning hours for each 20 credit right. course so that includes everything like um, your reading, your class time, assessment work and yeah. um, that's that's how the university sort of guides it. Thank you and I suppose that's quite a nice question, uh, quite nice lead into, um, is it possible for students to work during their MSc? Yes, but um, it is very much dependent on the visa regulations and, and the, the guidance that is set by the Home Office that we have no control over. Um, a lot of our students, both home students and international students, do have part-time employment while they are studying. Um, and we do recommend that you try and ensure that this doesn't affect. So working um, around the times that you, you wouldn't be in class, for example. Um, and to make sure that you keep a careful balance of um, work and, and your study, um, really take advantage of being a postgraduate study and uh, being a postgraduate student and actually being able to engage with your peers is such a, a really exciting thing to be able to do for a postgraduate um, student. So we 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 totally understand the, the need to work, but we recommend that you maybe don't work as much as you, you maybe want to. I think if you come in a student visa, the maximum number of hours you can work a week is 20. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and in terms of class sizes, what sort of numbers are in each of the classes? Do you so want to first, Julie? Sorry, I just... <laughs> no, on you go. <laughs> so the Global Mental Health Masters is a little bit smaller than the MPH, so we tend to have about 35 students. The MPH is a much bigger programme, um, so we are predicted, I think, to have around 85 to 90 students next year. Um, so for our, our core courses, they will be big, large classes for the kind of what we call lecture sessions, but the labs and seminars will be in a smaller setting with smaller groups of students. Um, and we will try to, to mix and match those seminar sessions so you are interacting with different students within the cohort. Um, and this is largely dependent on on what, um, for example, the, the programme that you choose to do for um, intro to epidemiology and stats, as Margaret had mentioned, we, we split the tutorials based on who's doing R and who's using STATA. Um, but so you will get to, to have smaller group teaching, but for the MPH is for semester one, there is a large group teaching element to it. Semester two is much smaller. Great, thank you. And then there's one for yourself, Julie. It's um, I'm looking to study global mental health uh, part time. What does that schedule look like? Yep. So we can be quite flexible about this, depending on how you want to kind of um, balance your studying. So there are six top courses that are needed to be complete completed over the two years. So we usually um, encourage students probably to complete three in the first year and then three in the second year. 
Um, so you can either do two in semester one and one in semester two, or you can do it the other way around, if that makes sense, just depending what kind of suits the student the best. So again, usually um, if somebody's wanting to study part time, um, I'm happy to meet with that student and come up with kind of an individual study plan because we are quite flexible depending on how the student wants to balance their time. Great, thank you. And in terms of jobs, what sort of jobs do graduates of the various programmes go on to do? For the MPH, a wide variety, a lot of a lot of different jobs that the MPH students go on to do. Um, a large proportion of our cohort are um, established health professionals within their home countries. So they may return home and um, engage within public health education and, and um, delivery in their own country, um, building on perhaps their medical education. There's obviously um, routes into working with NGOs, so that's non-governmental organisations, um, working with the government, working with health services, lots of different avenues. And I think it, it's there's a big need at the moment and a big push for a lot of folk focusing on data science, statistics, certainly for um, public health and epidemiology is a big, a big required skill for, for someone who is on the MPH programme. So again, for global mental health students kind of finishing the programme, they go on to a wide variety of careers. Um, our cohort of students that are coming to us um, all have a wide variety of expertise and loads of really good experience that they can share with their peers. Um, but yeah, I mean, lots of people go into lots of different things. We've had people who go on to take up um, lectureship posts, for example. We've had students who then go on to study PhDs or they go on to study at the doctorate in clinical psychology, for example. Other people have gone to work with government organisations, with NGOs, um, or have gone back to their kind of well-established kind of clinical career. Um, so wide, wide variety. And we're trying to track our alumni just to, um, you know, find out what they're, what they're all doing after they leave us. I think maybe just to, sorry, sorry, Naomi, just to add in, and I, I don't want to speak on behalf of Julie, but we've certainly got a LinkedIn group that you're more than welcome to join. And I think, Julie, you've got one as well. One as well. Yeah. So you can just search for us on um, LinkedIn and um, certainly have a wee look and a wee nosy and see what all of our alumni have been doing. Yeah, that's a top tip. Um, just um, on the Q&A box, someone's asking about social work. Do you have many social workers come on to your programme? So we've had a few actually that have um, completed the global mental health um, master's programmes. So yeah, we've had a couple of social workers that have, that have done our programme. I've only ever heard of maybe one or two on the, the public health programme, um, but that's not to say that there, there aren't, maybe they just haven't disclosed it. And I think, you know, um, thinking about if you can practice social work in this country, again, that's, that's very much um, related to social work regulations and it's something you would need to go and have a, an investigation of yourself. Thank you. Um, just a reminder, we do have a wee bit of time, so if you do have any questions, please do pop them into the chat box. <clears throat> in, in terms of an application, so if you've applied for the on-campus course but you've changed your mind, would like to do it online, would that be a case of submitting a new application for the online programme or is there a way to kind of move it across? I think if you get in touch with admissions, but yeah. Margaret might be better. Sorry, Margaret. And you'd have to, if if that is a if that happens and you want to do that, if you contact me via the generic email address, I will look into it. Um, it may be that you would have to submit a new application, but it would be the, exactly the same documents and everything. There wouldn't be any change. Um, but if that does happen to anyone, then please contact me, and I will check that for them. And I think maybe just to add that the um, recruitment for online and the admissions for online are a little bit less competitive than they are for the on-campus. So the, the on-campus courses are a bit limited in terms of numbers. Online, they are a bit, wee bit more flexible. So I think if you were wanting yeah, to and switch it, it, to the it, other way, then I think that would be very well. <laughs> and obviously because, especially if you're an international student, you don't need a visa. So the the application date is a bit later for the online programme than it is for the on-campus. Um, but I would just remind you that the on the online programme is a part-time programme, it's not a full-time programme. So it would take you um, a minimum of three years to do the online programme. Thank you. Um, there's a question there about start dates. Um, do you have a note of the start date for your programmes? Um, yes, I think they start on the... All programmes start at the same time. I think it's 
Freshers week is the 11th of September and the week one is the 18th of September. So teaching starts in week one, but there will be events and induction events on the 11th of, from the 11th of September onwards. Just add as well that um, there will be set of communications coming out. So there'll be an actual start date on your CAFs um, and then the website and that will be updated hopefully this week or next week. Um, and those dates will start getting issued to you um, just in terms of refreshers and things like that. <clears throat> um, there's a question there about optional courses. Um, what are the prerequisites for applying for is it oral health course? Mm -hmm. Is that right? Yeah. Yes, so we have the oral health course that runs as the Masters in Public Health. And Margaret, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it's due to be running next year. It will be running next year. There aren't any prerequisites for that course. If you're doing the MPH and you want to do oral health, then you can choose it as an option. You don't have to have a you don't have to be a dentist or have a background in oral health. It will be available to all students enrolled on the MPH on campus <laughs> there isn't an on there's not an online oral health course there's only an on-campus oral health course so i think there was a follow-up question i think you know you were saying that you would like to apply for it that's something that you can choose when you are selecting your options and and certainly when you get you you come um to start the program margaret will be the yes and there's no <laughs> That's a, because it is a more specialised course. There's never an issue with places on that course. Um, it, it, it always runs with um, smaller numbers than most of our optional courses. So there's it, if you, somebody wants to do that, then they will they will be able to do it. Some of the other that some of the other optional courses do run with much bigger numbers. So it, it may be that not everyone will be able to get a place. So what we would always encourage people to do is is you know enroll for their courses as soon as they can to make sure that they get the courses that they want to do. Perfect um, and there's one there for yourself Julie asking how soon can students approach uh, people like yourself to discuss uh, sort of class schedules if they were part-time is that something they do once they've enrolled or before? Yeah I mean I'm happy to do that once um, you're enrolled in induction week or you know happy to um, even do it sooner <laughs> just so that we've got an idea of what you want to do yeah you can drop me an email perfect um, and then someone said that they're a dentist and would like to apply I'm sure they would be welcome to apply <laughs> yes I mean, we have always every year even in the years that we don't do oral health because we only offer that every second year every year we have dentists on the MPH We've got a lot of dentists this year, yeah. actually. <laughs> we do have a lot of dentists this year, and they're they're just doing the general. I mean, some of them may choose a specialism, but yeah, um, absolutely, we have dentists every year. And I think just to add as well, it's a it's a really booming area of public health at the moment. Oral health and oral public health is a real key area, and certainly within um, developing countries, that's a, a kind of key aim for some of the developing countries' aims and goals and. Um, healthcare strategies so actually we, we are seeing that kind of move um, into it. Perfect. There's also a question there about work but that will I'm assuming just depend on your visa and what's allowed um, regarding that. Um, there's no more uh, questions that's them all answered there and um, so just for the last few minutes I suppose have you got any advice for students that are um, sort of preparing to start their studies or anything that you feel that's not being covered that you think would be good to add in? I mean, I would say if you haven't applied yet and you're you are what you are going to apply, I would encourage you to apply as soon as possible. Um, especially if you're an international student who will have to apply for a visa because you you do want to be here at the start of the program. Um, because some students will come a couple of weeks late, but you are missing a lot in those two weeks. We will try to catch you up, but you know, it's you know, you're that first two weeks is really important because you're you're joining at the rest of your students. So in you know applying for the, the a program and getting a place, you're not committing yourself to anything. So if you're not able to fund it or if something happens, you can defer your offer or you can withdraw your application. But I would strongly encourage you if you are um you know wanting to come in September and you haven't applied yet to do that as soon as possible. Does anybody know when enrollment opens? I'm not usually, sure. It's usually mid-August okay. um, that course enrollment opens. Students will be contacted about um, 
people about when the actual uh, enrolment date is, but it's usually sort of mid August. Yeah, and all that information will be emailed to you soon. I think um, I can't remember when it went out last year, but yeah, it will all be. If it's not emailed to you, it will then be available on the website, and then it will follow up in an email, so you'll get all that. Um, there was just a last few minute question that snuck in there for yourself, Julian. It's asking about classes. Do they usually start at seven, finishing at five? You did mention that there was a three hours um, sort of class time. Uh, do you want to just sort of clarify that? Yeah, we don't usually start before nine or half nine, to be honest. 7 a.m. is a little bit early for us. Um, no, so we usually start between nine and half nine. We're just finalising the timetable at the moment. Um, and yeah, we do finish by five for definite. Yeah. Perfect. And am I correct in saying that once enrolment opens and they start building their timetable, like their start times each day will become uh, clearer? Perfect. Um, well, that is us now. Just, oh, actually. We've got time, do we think, for another? Yeah. <clears throat> I'm not sure when the decisions about scholarships will be sent out. Again, that's not it's something right. just... I'm just trying, there's most university scholarships, there's not a separate application for them, that students, anybody, all applicants who are eligible for the scholarships are considered. And if you haven't heard, if you haven't been notified within six weeks of making an application, it means you haven't been shortlisted for the, the scholarship. There may be some others that it requires a separate application and if you go to your like the MPH or the global mental health web pages it will show you the scholarships that are available and the you know the the criteria but I know for most of the university ones there isn't a separate application all eligible applica um, uh, applicants are considered automatically. Thank you there is also a link in that chat box there for scholarships so there might be some further information on that that you could look at. Um, well, that is us now at the end of our session. We covered a lot there in a very short space of time. So thanks very much to our panel for taking time out of their busy day. Hopefully you've all found that interesting and useful. Um, like I said, we have recorded the session, so that will be made available to you um, in the coming days that you can just go back and rewatch anything that you might have missed or would like to rehear. Um, and again, if you have any further questions, please do get in touch with the programme administration email address. Um, and it will likely be Margaret that they'll pick that up and get back to you. Um, so yeah, so thanks very much everybody um, and we hope to see you all in September. So thanks again. Bye bye. Bye, bye now.